Good morning, U.S. History. Uh, today is Tuesday, October 20th. Um, I'm going to give you these notes in Screencastify, even though we met in Zoom briefly, uh, because it's just easier to do and, and it's really hard when people can't, when they have, when they can't keep up with the note taking. So um, you'll need a piece of paper and I'll give you your topic here in just a second. Um, first, make sure you have today's date. And then your topic is industrialization and the changing landscape. I'll give you a minute to write that. And then I want you to put the number 11.2. We're starting a new standard. Again, it helps me keep it all straight when I get it back and put it in the gradebook for you. So that's our topic, industrialization and the changing landscape. We're focusing in particular on the railroad today. I don't know if that sounds coming through. I have these dopey sound effects I added to every slide, sorry. But anyway, <laughs> what we're talking about today is the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, Transcontinental refers to this railroad crossing the continent for the first time. So when it's completed, it's going to be over 1,700 miles. It's going to start in Omaha, Nebraska. And if you see my pointer, that's right here. And it would uh, be connected to the one that's being built in Sacramento, California, right here. So what's going to happen is these two railroads are going to be building at the same time toward each other. And they're going to meet here at Promontory Point, Utah. So one's gonna be building this way, one's gonna be building this way, and they'll meet here. Once they do, that means that the East Coast and the West Coast of the United States are gonna be connected for the first time. Okay. That, if you hear that sound effect, that is the um, uh, railroad ties being uh, hammered together. So how this works, and what I'm going to hold you responsible for knowing, is these two lines are authorized by Congress in 1862. Now that's right when the Civil War has started. So Congress is a little distracted for the next, you know, three and a half years. But eventually this project will be funded and finished. The problem is, of course, as with everything, there's going to be some corruption involved. At one point, the railroad constructors were being paid by the mile. So they were incentivized to kind of build in zigzag patterns because it was, it was driving up the cost. So there was a lot of corruption and, and things involved with, um, you know, trying to bilk money out of this project. But overall, the part of the railroad that starts in Sacramento here is going to be the Central Pacific. The Central Pacific starts here and is building toward the east. The other side that started in Omaha is called the Union Pacific. So the Union and the Central Pacific are being built at the same time toward each other. You can see them labeled right here. And the difficult part, of course, is about this is mostly over here, Nebraska, Iowa area. It's flat. Um, the building was, of course, very difficult, but it's not going to be anything compared to what's being encountered over here. You have the Rocky Mountains to get through here, which means you're going to have to blast away like the sides of mountains to get the railroad through. So it's extremely dangerous work to be building at either end, but especially here because you've got a lot of explosives being used in the construction of that railroad. So you have two railroads being built at the same time, basically towards each other, one being built from the west and one being built from the east. So the west had hardly any existing railroads and obviously the east had a lot. Okay. The other uh, way is how this is funded. Um, I'm going to hold you responsible for knowing the big four. 
who are the financiers of this project, a lot of them in, in California because the California side uh, needed more funding than the other side. Um, but they're Collis Huntington, Mark Hopkins, Leland Stanford, and Charles Crocker. Two of those names might sound vaguely familiar if you're a Californian. Huntington, we know Huntington Lake. Um, there's Huntington Boulevard in Fresno. And also Stanford, Stanford University in Fresno was founded by Leland Stanford. So you're gonna hear these names quite a lot for our California references. Um, I'm obviously, I don't care if you know their, you know, first and middle initial, I just want you to know their last names so you can get them straight in your brains. So the big four are Stanford, Huntington, Hopkins, and Crocker. And you could hear the awesome, you know, cash register sound effect there, uh, because these are the guys that in particular are gonna finance the California side of the railroad. And of course, these guys become pretty prominent players in California after that point. Okay. So when the Civil War ends, there is an effort to get the railroad built even faster. So in 1865, Crocker um, is going to try to push to get more labor brought in to work on that western half of the railroad. Um, there's a workforce problem, of course, during the war because there's a war being fought. But after that, you have a lot of immigrants who are going to start pouring into the country for various reasons because of various things happening in the world. And you have this huge demand for workers on the railroad. So on the Western side, most of the workers are gonna be Chinese immigrants. And this is why you have a huge influx of Chinese coming in to, in particular, California. Um, it is why when you go to major cities in California, you have Chinatowns. Um, we'll get to the kind of not so happy history of that later. Um, on the West, on the Eastern side, excuse me, you have mostly Irish immigrants who are coming in. Um, Irish immigrants had been coming in since about the 1840s because of a huge famine in Ireland. And because of this, they fight in the American Civil War and then they start to work on the railroad. So this railroad is built almost entirely by immigrant workers. It was very dangerous, very, um, you know, hazardous work for them. Um, but altogether, you have about 10,000 Chinese immigrants who do work on that Central Pacific side of the railroad. Okay, I'm gonna pause right there really quickly. I'm gonna get you the very last thing I had these out of order here. Okay. So how this finally gets done is May 10th, 1869. The Central Pacific Railroad and the Union Pacific Railroad meet at Promontory Summit, Utah. The presidents of both railroads, Stanford and a guy named Durant, swing the last spike that holds the railroad ties together. It was a golden spike. They, you know, they drove it in and then people painted pictures and took photos and all that good stuff. And then they took it out and put a regular one in. But from that point on, May 10th, 1869, you have a connected nation. It means now I could get across the nation in maybe six or seven days, whereas before it would take me months in a wagon with horses. Um, so this was entirely new. It was so new that for us, things that we don't even think about that exist uh, had to be invented because now we were a connected country. Um, and one of those things is, oops, sorry. So sorry, it's time zones. That's where we're gonna finish up. Okay, so weirdly time zones are something we don't really think about unless we're trying to figure out what time a game is on on the East Coast or whatever. Uh, but before the railroads, each town kept its own time and they based it on the position of the sun. You knew when it was noon, and so you just worked from there. 
So you could say, well, I'm going to be, you know, coming into town Thursday. But you couldn't really say with any precision what time you were going to be there. Now, railroad companies, they demand precision. You have to know what time the train is leaving. You have to know what time the train is coming. So they devise a system of four time zones, Eastern, Central, Mountain, and Pacific. And we're going to have a little quiz on this later in the week. But most importantly, um, is going to be the impact on Native Americans. Because the plains are opening up and um, the land is required by the railroad companies, uh, Native Americans begin to be pushed out. They're going to be starting a long process in the 1860s of moving Native Americans out of the West and onto reservations. And it, of course, results in, you know, mass displacement and death for those people. We're going to be um, looking at something in a minute that's uh, kind of shows an example. Um, and also, of course, the buffalo they depended on for their survival starts to disappear. So right now, go ahead and pause your notes right here.